suckers going up. If you're in your 20s, retirement probably feels quite a while away. And if you're in your 30s like me, it probably feels even further away. But if you've seen any of my previous videos, you will know that starting and investing early, allowing compounding to just keep on doing its thing, will give you much more money later in life. If you're in your 20s, by the time you're 40, you will have so much more opportunity to make even more money for retirement. And if you're in your 30s, it might just give you a little bit of light at the end of that cold, dark, gray tunnel that is your nine to five job. You can tell I'm a little bit depressed at the moment about my own nine to five job. <laughs> the hardest part is getting started. And if you're anything like me, then all of this financial knowledge was new to you about a year ago. But if you now have that knowledge by watching lots of people on YouTube talk about exactly the same thing, then you have a chance. Your challenge is to take a slice of your monthly income and put it into whatever investment vehicle that you choose. But the important part is you never touch it again. And it's really no more complicated than that. Discipline. You rack a discipline. No, -uh, I don't rack a discipline. Keeping to this strategy is tough. There's always a car or a house or a trip to Benidorm. And all you want to do is just take out a little bit of that pot of cash. Just a little bit, just a little bit, just a tiny bit. Just it won't hurt, promise. The best way of keeping future you sticky mitts off your stash is to have an agreed investment goal. That's agreed with you and you in the future. My personal goal is some sort of financial freedom. I don't like to call it retirement because I always plan on working. And believe it or not, you can build up a big old pile of money, a pile so big that it starts to just make its own money. And there are lots of experts out there who all have their own opinions on how big this pot needs to be. So I've given up some of the biggest mouths in the financial space and tried to figure out how much I should be contributing each month, exactly how big my retirement pot needs to be, and how should I live my life to get to that point. First on the list is one of my favorite guys, Dave Ramsley. Dave is a God-fearing Southern financial guru. I'm debt free! <laughs> yeah! Don't be in debt. Hates debt. Instead, we're running around going, hey, look how rich that guy is, and you'll never get there because the game is fixed. I don't think he hates all debt, but I think he realizes that most people are fucking idiots and they won't have the discipline to deal with credit cards. Dave's got his own program, I think it's called Baby Steps, where he gets you out of debt, then builds an emergency fund, and then you invest 15% of your monthly income into the stock market. And this is where my agreement with Dave's plan kind of stops. Dave Ramsey seems to assume a 12% return from mutual funds. You know those same mutual funds that never beat the market and charge ridiculous feeds? Those mutual funds. And he assumes that in retirement, you can have a safe withdrawal rate of 8%. Seems unrealistic. So to create Dave Ramsey's final pot of money, you need to take your annual income and divide it by 0.08. This gives you your final figure that you can withdraw at 8%. Probably feels pretty high. Our next financial guru is Susie Orman, who has the eyes of a maniac and a haircut that says, can I speak to your manager? Susie Orman is famous for saying that you need five to $10 million in your account before you can retire. She supposedly said that this is about people in their 20s and 30s. So if you're going to retire in your 30s, you need about 5 million quid in your bank account. And she absolutely hates things like the FIRE movement, financial independence, retire early. She hates those sorts of movements because they're simply unrealistic. To quote her, she says, personally, I think it's just ridiculous. You will get burned if you play with fire. I've always looked at Susie Orman as someone who's slightly detached from reality. She doesn't live with us peasants and she's a bit of a salesperson. But she does agree there is no quick way to these large sums of money. It takes a long time. She seems to believe that everyone has a really high income and should live very comfortably while they're saving. Saving 15 to 20% of their monthly income. And in retirement, Susie Orman believes in the 4% rule or something similar too. This rule states that your annual salary should make up 4% of your total retirement pot. That way, because the stock market goes up 8%, when you're withdrawing, you still have your portfolio growing. But Susie Orman has one small caveat that you can't live off any of that financial freedom money in your first three years. In the first three years, she says you should live off an emergency fund because if the market tanks in the first three years, then you have a very poor chance of keeping that portfolio going into later life. If the market did go down, then you have that money to live off until the market recovers again. It does feel like it makes a lot of sense, but that's a lot of money to have sitting around doing absolutely nothing when it could be growing with your portfolio. 
Also, I feel like Susie Orman just needs way too much money. She obviously thinks that there's a lot of plastic surgery in her future compared to maybe what I have. <laughs> so simply save 15 to 20% of your monthly income for a very, very long time. And your final retirement part calculation, according to Susie Orman, would be your annual income divided by 0.04 plus three times your annual salary which actually sounds pretty reasonable and I have no idea why she came up with this five to 10 million number. Next, one of my favorites is Mr. Money Mustache. This guy is king of the fire movement. This is exactly the same fire movement that Susie Orman hates. Check out his blog, MrMoneyMustache.com. It's all about life hacks, living frugally and saving in broad-based index funds. I first came across Mr. Money Mustache from the Choose FI podcast. It's a little podcast that I listen to, which has a lot of really cool tips and tricks for choosing FI. Lots of fire movement inspiration. Following this path, Mr. Money Mustache retired at 30. I say retired in quotes because he still has a blog. He's on loads of TV shows and he makes a lot of money that way. So not quite retired. Throughout his early life, he saved 50 to 80% of his paycheck every month. This guy got it done fast, which I kind of like. And like a true fire starter, he doesn't believe that increasing your income is most important, but reducing your expenses. Whereas Susie Orman kind of sees it the opposite way. But strangely, as much as Susie Orman hates the fire movement, she still believes in exactly the same 4% rule. Triple M doesn't base his calculation off your income though, he bases it on your expenses. So to work out how much money you need in retirement, you simply take your annual expenses, you basically figure out how much you spend on McDonald's, and then you divide those annual expenses by 0.04. And finally, Robert Kiyosaki, the famous writer of that book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, has a totally different idea. He doesn't believe in living below his means. He doesn't believe in saving. He simply states that rich people buy more and more cash flow producing and passive income assets. Basically, use your existing money to buy more things that get you more money. Kind of like houses, businesses, that's about as far as I got. This means that Robert Kiyosaki doesn't have a retirement number. He just says buy more and more cash producing assets and you'll never have to cut down on your spending. My only problem with this is that you need cash to get started or you have to leverage yourself up to the eyeballs. To become a landlord and buy some cash producing rental properties, you need to have that cash in the first place. And you only get that by saving up enough for a deposit. It's a very powerful argument, buying cash flow producing assets that will continue paying long after you're gone but it's very hard to achieve. Now you might have been hoping that I'd have included some UK voices into here, but the truth is there aren't any, or at least I couldn't find any. There doesn't seem to be anyone from the UK out there who can take the helm as successful and financially free. They're either too early in their journey, not willing to talk about it, or simply want you to put your money into low risk savings accounts. It's a pretty poor show from the UK in this space. I personally think you can learn a lot from all these people and the answer is probably somewhat a mix of all of them. Dave Ramsey is simple, don't get into stupid debt. Susie Orman's right as well, it probably is a good idea to have an emergency fund saved up in some savings so you can live off it for a year. Mr. Money Mustache, live below your means, probably great advice for people who can't increase their income too much. I'm trying to come at this from my life where I did spend too much and I have quite a ceiling on my available income as a paramedic it's very hard to leverage my time against that job. I plan to do this through dividend growth investing, but I think Robert probably means more towards real estate. At the early stage of this investment journey, that's my plan, is buying dividend growth companies. These companies all pay me some sort of money every couple of months. Right now, because I have quite a small portfolio at 35303, I don't earn that much of a monthly income right now. It's pretty small. Right now, it could be one of the worst times in history to buy a house for cash producing purposes. At least in here, my real estate assets like Avalon Bay Communities, uh, Lennar Corp and Tritex Big Box are all very liquid and I can easily apply the 4% rule when I'm much older. I've calculated that at a minimum, I can survive on about 16,000 a year. That's all I personally really need to live and that includes my mortgage. And that gives me a financial freedom number of about 400,000. So I can take my initial investment right now of 35,000 and I can add a monthly contribution of 1,000 pounds and I'll do this over 20 years. I'll put this at an estimated interest rate of 7% because the market average is about 8% minus fees and I'll put in an interest rate variance of 4%. So it could go 4% either way over the next 20 years. 
calculate that up, and in 20 years, apparently I'll have 505,000 pounds. And if I do end up beating the market at a rate of 11%, I'll have 798,000 pounds. And if I don't make any capital gain and I only grow my dividends, and remember, my current dividend portfolio is about two to 3%. So if I only earn 3% on my dividends, I'll make 328,000 pounds. This is one of the reasons why I personally have chosen dividend growth strategy. It doesn't matter what your strategy is, remember, you just need to be disciplined. But dividends within companies seem to be very predictable over very long periods of time. And if I can stay with these strong cash flow generating companies over the long term, it's very possible that eventually I can just live off the dividends that these companies pay me. In fact, by year 14, my portfolio could produce my entire yearly expenses just in dividends. And the longer that I allow this to continue, the more comfortable I'm going to be to work whenever I want to. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. The sucker's going up. In following this past myth, the myth, the money, myth, myth. It's really hard to say, Mr. Money Mustache. Mm, I just said it.